Hello and welcome to episode 82 of The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am a gardener and this is a gardening podcast. It is a gardening podcast recorded in the sweltering heat of early August 2020. I had been intending to record this last night, which would have been the Friday night after after the weekend gardening, which you'll hear about. But it was 34 degrees when I when I got off the train at Maribone, and after cycling through that that wall of hot, humid city air, all I wanted to do was, was open a beer and let let the world swim under my eyelids. So this is a, a morning recording rather than an evening one. As is essential on podcasts at this time of year, there is some discussion of the weather in this week's episode, and also some talk of tying in rambling roses, a, a helter-skelter design that I'm using on a poplar tree. There is some talk of deadheading, some talk of watering, some talk of wilting, and much, much more excitingly, some talk of scything. We now have a scythe and an expert scyther on the gardening staff. And we have been playing with it adjacent to the meadow in the hope that the entire meadow will, will fall under its blade this year. It really is a very exciting episode, in the main part thanks to, to that new tool. So I suggest that we do not linger here on this introduction and instead get on with the week in gardening. Welcome to the week in gardening, a week in which I returned to the garden after five days away doing the, the momentous and heartbreaking job of settling my little son into his nursery. I returned to the garden with that fond feeling that comes from a period of absence and also with the profound shock of midsummer growth. I shouldn't be surprised, but for about the twelfth year in a row, I'm shocked by just how fast things grow and fade at this time of year. Some plants are shooting out and up at the same time as others are, are frizzling and frying in the heat. We are growing some climbing butternut squash, except we haven't built a structure for it, so it's going out along the bed at the moment, and it's putting on about eight inches a day in all directions. It's advancing on, on all of the other little vegetable plants, like some horrible, inexorable glacier of, of vegetation to swallow them all up. The variety is one called butter pie, and I don't know if we've got particularly vigorous specimen, but its tendrils are about as long as my forearm. They're the huge, great things that are looking for something to twine, but at the moment they, they haven't found anything, so they're growing straight and long. They look like the, the barbels on the, the mouth of a, of a very, very large catfish. I think that pumpkin tendrils are edible, so these you could probably snip off if we wanted to, and, and salt and deep fry as, as a wonderful, crisp delicacy. I don't know if anyone has tried that in their vegetable patches. Perhaps Nigel Slater has. That's the kind of thing he might have got up to. Anyway, on Monday, I spent some time sorting out the plants that have now done their business, taken their boughs, and retreated into the, the soily little, little wings of our, our garden stage to wait for next year's show. So I took off all of those Ligularia, the Ligularia zepta, which have been fantastic in the garden this year. And then most of the very, very big, showy crocosmias, the lucifers and their ilk, those huge ones that, that, that flower and then immediately develop seeds the size of a fat garden peas. And you think, how on earth did you have time to do that? I looked at you the other day and you were in your wonderful zigzagging flower bud and now you're heavy with seed. What is going on? So I chopped those down and made them look a little neater. And then I got onto the ladders and started tying in my rambling rector rose. The rambling rector is the one that lurked behind the tree for two years 
while I willed it onwards and is now shooting up like some sort of kraken dragging down a boat and I'm, I'm tying it into the bare stems of this poplar that grows at the bottom of the garden and it would be a fairly simple job just to just to knock it in there but I'm doing a little helter skelter style spiral around the trunk of the trees it's a very very flat spiral so were it actually a helter skelter it'd be one of those awful frustrating helter skelters that doesn't allow you any momentum where you have to constantly squidge your your ankles towards your bum and push yourself forwards and, and try and get gravity on your side enough to to give you a little fun one of those type of helter skelters and the reason for that is that in common with many plants the rose produces more flowering wood more flowering shoots when the stem is horizontal because the plant quite reasonably thinks it has reached the top of its tree or whatever it was scrambling up and is now wiggling and waving out in the breeze. Flowers are just flags after all. They're just a colourful means of uh, attracting attention. And the rose that grows horizontal thinks that it has a prime spot for, for attracting that attention. It was a good day, a, a good welcome back into the garden. I enjoy climbing trees to tie things in. It's one of those satisfying jobs that, that involves almost a tool belt of things, of soft ties and secateurs and little hammers and nails, and you feel like a proper horticulturalist doing it. You feel this is skilled work, this is the equivalent of, of some beautifully designed cabinet made by someone with a 12-year with a apprenticeship. It's not just an outdoor form of tidying up, which much as I, I love our, our profession and, and the career I'm in, a lot of our work is, is just wandering around cleaning things that happen to be growing. Which leads me very nicely on to Tuesday, on which I did some lawn cutting. The, the classic outdoor tidying job. You get a mower, you walk behind it. You can do some straight lines, and there is certain pride in that. But it is a sphere where, where diligence is perhaps more important than talent. I enjoy it immensely because it gives me time to, to daydream, to think about what I might be saying on the next episode of The Garden Look. So I can wander behind the lawnmower and think, what was that pattern I was trying to achieve on the Rambling Rector? Was it a helter-skelter or was it a barber's pole? More of a helter-skelter, I think. And other such thoughts that, that pop into the mind. I also did some restorative pruning. Well, I, I don't know if I can actually call it restorative. Restorative implies that it was to, to provide a greater benefit for the plant in the future. It was to hide our mistakes and to hide the, the ravages of the weather. Some of the tree ferns got blasted by the heat at the end of the previous week and had crispy patches on their fronds, some fronds completely crisped up entirely. And so the idea was to get in there and reduce the, the crowns of the ferns so that they didn't hang around these, these huge rags of, of dead and demonstrate our, um, our, our lack of care and to make them somehow seem natural it is quite a tricky job because if you take out one frond in a perfect circle of tree thorn fronds you can't really notice but if you take out three next to each other then you suddenly create a gap like like a ruined smile like someone who's who's had a tooth knocked out in a fight on the day of a modeling shoot and it's not a particularly attractive look so then you need to take out a few more on the other side and balance it and and get things generally <laughs> looking looking much smaller it's it's quite hard not to end up with just a, a stump which is probably the most natural look that you can go for from there but i think that we we achieved something slightly better we ended up taking out on on the tree ferns that had been scorched almost all the leaves that grew upwards so there was a little collar a rough of a down growth the, the, the ferns that had been shaded by the other leaves around these particularly scorched tree ferns. They look a bit like those, those long tube worm you see it on a coral reef, that, that big long stem with a few little tentacles coming out of the top. I have to say that I don't think that we can take too much blame for the, the fate of those fronds. They had 
been fairly shaded and happily doing their thing. And then they just got very, very intense sun very early in the day and didn't didn't seem to cope with it very well. Slightly further back under the trees, the, the tree ferns all remain pristine and wonderful. So hopefully the eye will just skim over these, these little beruffed tree ferns in front and land on, on the big green woodland giants. Wednesday was a day of very hot humidity. It was breezy, but the, the breeze felt like it was just pushing slabs and, and sails of, of wet, warm air into us. It was the kind of air movement that I imagine you get inside the windpipe of some giant organism. There is, there is movement, there is definitely molecules rushing past, but they are, they are rather wet and not particularly soothing. It's the kind of weather that you revel in if you are a giant squash out to take over the entire veg patch. Our job for the day was much, much more exciting. My colleague has been bought a scythe, a fantastic Austrian scythe, and along with it, a scything course, which he had done at the weekend. And he came with the, the scythe to work and very patiently tried to show me a little bit of what he had learned on the course. And it was one of the most innovating and uplifting days in the garden I've had for ages. What it showed was the utility and the uses of this instrument. I had somehow assumed that the scythe was an incredibly specialist bit of haymaking equipment and should not be touched for any other purpose, should lie sacrosanct in some loft until the grass smells sweet and it is cooled out again. But uh, my colleague informed me that no, that is not the case at all. The scythe is a blade on a stick and it has as many uses as you can imagine for a blade on a stick. And so we went out and took down some weeds with it. There's an area of disturbed ground next to the meadow where they were doing some, some building work and laying some pipes. And the seed bank has erupted there, not with all of the brilliant meadow species. And by the way, we've got pyramid orchids in the meadow for the first time this year. I didn't mention it earlier, but, but now I will. They didn't spring up. It didn't cover itself in, in pyramid orchids. It covered itself in the, the annual persicaria, uh, that wonderful weed that's very attractive, and fat hen and chickweed as the, the first annual growers, those, those sprinters in the race for light. And so we took them down with the scythe, which was a brilliant job because these are not wiry, dried out grass stems. They are fat, succulent weed stems. They're almost begging to be sliced through. And it takes me back to my favorite way of weeding which is weeding with a long, whippy stick. Something like those white fiberglass cross poles that you get in a, in a cheap diamond-shaped kite. It's an incredibly fun and visceral way of, of getting rid of, of annual weeds. But the problem is that it is not delicate at all. You rely on the, the whipping movement and momentum that comes with it. That's what takes you through the nettle. But it also takes you through the, the adjacent lily and through the bystander's eyes. And, and with a scythe, you can get that same feeling that, that you are the destroyer of weeds. But without the, the flailing backswing. With a properly sharpened blade, you need almost no force behind it at all. To, to describe the force, I would say, imagine that you are walking at this time of year when the toads have hatched and they're, they're getting fat, but you're walking in a, in a different week in an alternative universe in which it's very wet and drizzly and the, the toads have come out to search for all the little slugs and snails that have sallied forth from the borders. And you come across a toad in the road and you worry because this road has infrequent cars, but the ones that do come, they come very fast, and they're definitely going to squash the toad. And so what you do is you, you nudge it with the end of your stick. You, you nudge it and wake it up, and it, it reluctantly stretches its toady legs and, and trundles back into the grass of the verge. And that kind of nudge, that gentle toad-protecting nudge, is all you need with the scythe 
to take down a section of weeds like these. It was remarkable. It was really, really joyous. And the precision that you get with the, the point of the scythe is fantastic because if you have your, your lily stem, say, next to the nettles, all you need to do is move the tip of the scythe past the, the lily stem so that were you to nudge it, you're nudging it with the blunted, rounded back of the scythe and then pull it towards you and the nettle is gone. It somehow makes gardening feel a, a part of you more than when you use a strimmer, for example. I think it's just the blade. It's such an innate part of, of the human experience. Ever since we have worked out that you can, you can chip a bit of flint and it gets sharper and sharper, we've been using this sort of stuff. This is the human tool par excellence. Whereas the, the strimmer's petrol-driven, whirling circle of death, we need, we need a, couple of, a couple of hundred thousand years of, of, of coexistence before that becomes a natural, uh, joyous process for us. My colleague is very good at scything, it seems to me. He's modest about it, but it looks like he's, he's got a pretty good technique there. I am not at all, but I think we're going to play around a little bit more and then maybe try to cut the meadow with scythes. It would save that horrendous, horrible, petrol belching, bone-shaking job of hiring the allet mower, that little hedge trimmer attached to a huge engine that we used to cut the meadow in previous years. So, so watch this space. If you don't hear anything about us sizing the meadow on the podcast, it means that I didn't perfect my technique. I threw out my hips, my hands got plastered in blisters, and I had to go to the tool hire office. On Thursday, I was at home waiting for the, the heat to build up, reading books and looking after, looking after the boy. And on Friday, I went back to work. I went back in listening to the Today programme as I cycled across London and everyone was getting very excited about the temperatures. Will it beat the previous records? Are we going to see crushes on the beaches? Uh, and all of those things. So that's quite exciting when you go in and you know that, that things are really building. And the whole nation, I think, had been been seized by this oh my goodness we're going to have a hot day energy because at six o'clock there were more people on the street than at three o'clock people had obviously decided to live a little bit of the mediterranean lifestyle uh, and get their jobs done in the morning before collapsing out in the in the midday i took a leaf from their book not by going for a, a 6 a.m jog but by doing the grass cutting very early i had some pedestrian cutting to do and i cut almost straight away with dew still on the grass which sometimes isn't ideal for collecting, but you're not getting much grass off the lawn at this time of year. Lawns slow down a lot in midsummer. And really, I was doing it so that I had nice stripes on the lawn for, for the weekend. And doing it at eight in the morning just avoids that horrible prison yard torture feeling of walking behind a, a chewing, smoking mower under the high, hot sun. And then for the rest of the day, it was watering, really. On days like these, you always feel that you are reaching the plant just two minutes before it dies. There is so much terrifying wilting going on. And of course, this is, this is nonsense. It's a sign of overinvestment in a garden, a sign of overattachment, because wilting in plants is completely normal. It's a reaction to, to horrendous heat. They very rightly say, well, I don't fancy losing all of my water through these leaf pores, so I'm not going to put any water in my leaves. And so when you see a hydrangea or a rudbeckia in someone else's garden, and its leaves are all pointing directly at the ground, hanging there limp, like sort of wet green tissue paper, you think, well, that's a sensible plant. I'm sure that'll perk up this evening. But when you see it in your garden, you think, oh my goodness, where's the hose reel? I've got to catch this. If I don't get here in the next 30 seconds, it is going to be a dead plant. And of course it's not. Of course it's not. And you know that. You know that intellectually. But, but in the heart, it's hard to see. So I probably spent too much time chasing around after these plants. And that was it. The end of another week in the life of a professional gardener. It was a good week, full of exciting bits of temperature and exciting new techniques. It's a, a revivifying experience using that scythe. I just, 
I know I'm keeping going on about it, but when you cut through a patch of these weeds, say you'd cut through your, your persicaria, you could look down and see a perfect cross-section of the stem. You could see whether you went through the main stem, where you get just the, the, the green little hollow tube inside, or whether you went through a node where it was solid with a little red ring or, or of budding cells. You could actually see that cleanness of cut. You could see afterwards what had been what, whether that had been fat hen or whether it had been chickweed by the different cut cross-section in, in the stalk left. When you use a strimmer, you just get a mangled sea of, of blown up stumps as if a larch wood were, were hit by a very big bomb. And that doesn't seem right somehow. So anyway, sorry, enough, enough about the scythe, enough about the scythe. Let's see if I have any more recommendations this week. I have been reading books and I've been reading four books that are quite similar. So I'm going to do a, a sort of lumped review and recommendations because these are all books of definitely the same genre, the same, the same ilk. They are books of person and place and history where a, a writer takes one little bit of land and traces its history both the history of, of human occupation on the land and particularly the history of, of the nature that grows there in immense detail. One of them was the book that I mentioned at the end of last week's podcast, These Silent Mansions, A Life in Graveyards by Jean Sprackland, which was wonderful, beautiful writing. Sometimes I got a little bit lost in the meanders, but I'm certain that that is my fault and not Jean's. Then I read Ghost Trees, Nature and People in a London Parish by Bob Gilbert. And that's all about the trees and nature of the East London Parish of Poplar, a very poor deprived parish with lots of arterial roads running through it, but not going to it, as Bob very perceptively points out. And it's about his hunts for, for the original poplars and the mulberry trees and the, and the plane trees of the area. It's good and, and, and well worth a read. Then the third one I've been listening to on Radio 4, which is The Oak Papers by James Canton. And that's more personal. It's pulling in little bits of, of poetry that the author remembers. Oh, this evening I was reminded of one of my favourite blah, 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 that kind of thing. It's on Radio 4 as the book of the week this week. And it's definitely worth checking out on the, on the BBC's various catch-up services, not least for its narrator's voice, which is such a portentous received pronunciation job that every sentence seems to speak of these hidden and violent mysteries when the narrator intones about, about the first Swifts returning. And you think, my God... How terrible! Is there is there an army of them over the hill? Are these the harbinger swifts of, of things to come? So, so it's wonderful for hearing him. I actually looked him up to, to see who he was, and he specialises in in um, voicing villains in computer games. People like like Karath the Bone Breaker, and I think that, I think that's very good fun. So so go and find that. And finally, the the last of these books was called The Wood for the Trees, The Long View of Nature from a Small Wood. And that's by Richard Forty. I think it's my favourite of the four, partly because it's about his interactions and musings on a small wood, just four acres that he buys. But he buys it in the Chilterns above Henley, which is very close to where I garden. So each paragraph about life in the shade and rustle of the beech trees seems very personal to, to where I am. And also because Forty is a, a very, very well-respected scientist. He's a fossil expert, a paleontologist and a geologist, and he's written books before and made television programs about science. So he seems to have an effortless ease in gathering the diverse strands that make up these books. It's, it's a pretty easy format. It relies very much on, on the writer's skill and all, all of these writers do it very well 
if you wanted to do a, a sample chapter for yourself, you'd pick a tree nearby and then you'd go for a walk and you'd feel that the breath of spring in the still cold wind of winter and you might look up and see a snagged bag, a little carrier bag ripped and flying in the tree which would remind you of something, remind you of the pennants of a, of a Viking ship. And you'd wonder, had the Danish warlord, who, who famously fought a battle over yonder, crossed this field on the way to, to the massacre? Maybe, probably. Does it matter? It might remind you of a decorated maypole, and then you can talk about the dances of your youth, or it might remind you of a, a famous Elizabethan handbag designer, and then did he sit under this tree while he thought of new ideas for, for bags and, and stuff, and then you think, well, maybe he did and maybe he didn't. Maybe what's important is the fact that I thought this thought, which reminds me that man's life is short and a tree's life is long. And we shall all return to, to dust soon enough. And then the wind blows a little colder. And then you, the author, describe a cloud and head for home before the next chapter. It's one of my absolute favourite types of writing. And all four of these authors do it very well. So, so go, and, go and find those books. I'll try to put a link in the, the podcast description. I must say a huge thank you. These books I bought mostly from hive.co.uk, which is a site for people who don't necessarily want to use Amazon. And I bought them with the fantastically generous donations of people who have supported this podcast. So I want to say thank you to, to Anonymous, to Elizabeth, to Cynthia, to Rhiannon, to Christine, to Jonathan Baikowski, and to Juliet who donated between the last and this podcast. I really, really do appreciate it. It keeps me coming back to this microphone and it gives me good things to, to nourish the mind. So thank you very, very much for that. Now I must go and drag myself out into the heat of another frazzling London day. I hope that wherever you are, whether in sun or in shade, you have a wonderful time. I hope that you see some nature even if you don't manage to do any interfering with it. And I will see you all here next time for episode 83 of The Garden Log. Thank you very much and goodbye.